great to be here with you all. I'm probably not the best person to speak to you about business. I'll be very honest with you. But I want to speak to you a little bit about money. And money is involved in business. It's involved in probably almost everything that we do. Now, I run an organization called One Day's Wages, and it's a movement to fight extreme global poverty. So I'll get to it, but I want to first talk about money. Money, according to sociologists, they estimate that about 80 to 85 percent of those who are awake, so when you're not sleeping, 80 to 85 percent of our time engages in some way economics and money. You're either earning it, spending it, or dreaming about it. Okay, one of those three things. So it's really all around us in some way. As I continue talking to you a little bit about money, I want to share something that isn't meant to be shock jock, but just simply the truth. We are so freaking blessed. We really are. We live in a world, you and I, in our world, where we have access to so much. So whether it's in business or our personal lives in some way, my hope is to encourage you to look at money in a way, not simply to elevate or build our own empire, but how can we help others, particularly others in the larger world that don't have access to similar things that we do. Um, uh, let me give you an example of how incredible of a world that we live in. We do certainly live in a phenomenal world. Uh, in the chats that we've heard so far, you've heard glimpses of just the amazing things that we have available in our hands. Technology, for example. Some of you are playing with your smartphones, you're tweeting, you're updating your statuses. It's amazing to think that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, how much society has progressed in terms of technological advances. Do you remember your first phone? For some of you guys who are college students, it's probably not the best crowd to ask you to think about your last or your first phone. But I remember my first phone. I actually brought it with me. Okay. <laughs> this was my first phone. Every now and then, when I need a good laugh, I'll drive around Seattle pretending I'm still talking on it. <laughs> it's amazing. Hey, how are you? Text me. In about 15 years, the phone has advanced in some amazing, amazing ways. This is something that I don't have to communicate to you about. The world has progressed in so many amazing ways, and yet we live in a world today of some amazing disparity. And I want to encourage you to take some moment to open your eyes and your heart to the reality that we live in a very unbalanced world. Uh, one day's wages were focused around an issue called extreme poverty. Not to drown you with numbers or statistics, but I'll just share a few things that speak a picture about extreme poverty. Extreme poverty speaks to about the 1.4 billion people in this world that live in extreme poverty. And the best way for me to articulate what extreme poverty are these five things that I have in my hands right now. Extreme poverty are those who live and survive on five quarters a day. Now, I share this not to make you feel guilty or to overwhelm you, but to simply articulate the amazing, incredulous issue that in our world where you and I can acknowledge that we have so much, we're so blessed, and there's so many advances, yet we live in a world of such imbalance. 
where 900 million people do not have access to clean water. In the few times I've traveled to certain places in the developing world, it is amazing to me to speak to certain women and I ask them, when you wake up in the morning, what is it that you dream to? What, what is it that you wake up to? What is it that you wake up to? For many of us, it's probably our smartphones. We're checking our emails, let's be honest, it's our best friend, it's right next to us on our bed, and yet to speak to certain people who say, when I wake up in the morning, the first thought that I have is where will I get clean water for my children and for my family? We live in a world today where access to education should not be a privilege, but should be a right. It is good that you are here at the fine institution of the University of Washington, and yet we have approximately 72 million primary age children that are not able to go to school. Now, I can tell you statistics after statistics, but what I want to talk to you about today is why is it that in our world of so much plenty and in our world of innovation, which we see all around us, including in the business and technology world, why is it that we haven't been able to bring access to certain basic things to people? I think the reasons are complex for sure. Probably not something that we can resolve in the next 10 minutes. But I want to contend with you that maybe one major reason why this is still an ongoing issue, whatever the issue of justice may be, it could be even local homelessness. In our great city of Seattle, on a given night, there's anywhere from 7,000 to 8,000 homeless people out in the streets. I would contend with you that one of the reasons, a major reason, and this is probably not the best forum for me to share this, but I'll just say it, is because ideas are overrated. They're overrated. I fear that if you're anything like me, I don't know you, I can't pretend that I know you, but if you're anything like me, it's possible that you might be more in love with the ideas of certain things than the actual commitment to such things. Like, I'll give you an example. Who here doesn't love the idea of compassion? Raise your hand so we can call you a jerk. <laughs> I mean, seriously, have you ever jerked? Have you ever met someone that doesn't love the idea of certain noble tributes? Honestly, I haven't. Who doesn't love the idea of justice and mercy and kindness? I think all of us, we all love the idea of certain things until we realize there's a cost to us. Then we back up. Do we really love the idea to a point that we're willing to commit, willing to make a sacrifice even at the expense of my comfort or my bottom line? Several years ago, I was uh, traveling and in my travels, I visited a country called Burma, otherwise known as Myanmar. It's probably a little embarrassing to tell you that prior to this trip, I had not really heard much about Burma. The only occasion that I heard something substantive was through a U2 song called Walk On, where this guy named Bono wrote a tribute song to a woman named Aung San Suu Kyi who is finally out of jail in the news right now. And during my time here in the jungles of Burma, I had a chance to visit 
couple schools, makeshift schools in the jungles. And in these makeshift schools, I witnessed something that just kind of blew me away because it was at that moment I realized that I had grown more enamored with ideas than the commitment to executing, living out certain convictions and dreams. So I was in this classroom, use your imagination, it's like makeshift chairs and desks, and in the front there was this poster about the size of this particular dimension. And as I walked into this classroom, my eyes were riveted and drawn and disgusted by this poster. Now, I didn't want to play your classic Western colonial arrogant person and judge, but that poster made me vomitatious. It was very disturbing. I questioned if that was appropriate in a classroom for first to fifth graders. One of my hosts saw that I was very disturbed and said, Mr. Cho, please come closer. And as I came closer, I was even that much more nauseous because it was a poster of men, women, and children, photographs cut and taped on of missing arms, legs, and oozing bloody body parts in front of the classroom. Mr. Cho, come closer. Uh, you see these green contraptions here on, on the bottom? Reticent, I looked. He said, these are landmines. And we have to teach our young children how to avoid landmines. The world is larger than the world that you live in. It was later that day I spoke and met with this family here. And this gentleman, this father figure, was one of the elders of the villages. And I asked him probably not one of my best questions. I said, uh, what's hard? In his broken English, he said many things. But knowing that I had visited this particular classroom, he said to me, well, um, school and education is hard. And you can speak with lots of experts on global development and business, and they'll tell you education is key. So I said, well, what about school is hard? He says, well, paying teachers' salaries is hard. Being the inquisitive person that I am, I said, how much are their salaries? He sticks out his four fingers, and he says, $40 U.S., Instantaneously, I responded by saying, uh, per day. And he laughed and chuckled. And I think as he was laughing and chuckling inside his head, he was saying, you arrogant jerk, you. He goes, no. So I apologized and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You, you, you mean $40 a week? And he chuckled and he just shook his head. Are you serious? I thought in my mind, really? $40 a month? And so I asked him, except this time he stopped chuckling. His face turned stoic. And he again said, $40 a year. I had an idea. I had a conviction. All of you have ideas and thoughts and convictions. It's not the ideas that matter. It's not the ideas that change the world. It's really our commitment to living out and implementing such things. Came back to Seattle. This is my family. We look this good all the time. <laughs> it's not photoshopped. My kids are in these dresses every single day. I would have worn this tie had it not been for 
TEDx policies about not wearing ties. Sat down with our children and my wife and explained this particular concern and conviction. And after days and weeks and months, I share this not to boast, but we had this dream and this idea of starting a organization, a nonprofit called One Day's Wager, where we would inspire people around the world with the most transparent, efficient organization, where we would donate 100% of everything that comes in and asking people to simply consider giving at least one day's wages every single year which is 0.4% of one's annual income. For us as a family, not to sound boastful, we made a decision to give up an entire year's wages, $68,000 a year. It took us about three years to save and simplify and give away certain things. But one of the great convictions that we had, and maybe this is a story that I can kind of end with, is that one of the reasons, beyond the fact that we're more in love with ideas, is that many of us think we don't have enough. Our businesses, we don't have enough. We want more. Our schools, we want more. Our individuals, our families, our children, we want more. We want the biggest and the latest gadget. We live in a constant upward mobility. And so in that same fashion, our family, we wrestled and we struggled. And I realized that when you make $68,000 a year in Seattle, I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but I know for us, honestly, there are plenty of days when we say, gosh, it would be nice to have more. But do you realize how filthy rich I am? For example, I know that you realize that there's a guy named Bill Gates here in Seattle. I call him Billy. Billy, he's ranked probably, what, second or third in terms of world wealth. He's, I also have a rank as well. My rank is I am the 52nd million, 40,000, 162nd richest person in the world. You better respect Now, I know that doesn't seem like a, a lot. In terms of percentage, I'm in the top 0.86 percentile in the world. What if businesses, what if college students, what if all of us made generosity not something we dream about, we have an idea for, but we choose to do it now. This is my encouragement, particularly for college students. Some of you are thinking, I'll wait till later. I'll wait when my business is up and running. Who you are and the decisions that we make now, when we don't have much, when our companies or our ideas or our businesses are still a thought, will go a long way to that conviction being the very heart and engine of much of how we live our lives. Let me close with this thought. When I had this experience in Burma, I was um, overwhelmed. You ever feel that way? Ideas are good, but you feel overwhelmed. And I know this sounds so simple, but maybe this is an encouragement for us not to over-complexify so many things. There's a quote from Mother Teresa that goes like this. And I was reminded of this during my time in Burma as I sat in front of that classroom overwhelmed by that poster. If you can't feed 100 people, then just feed one. That's my encouragement to you. Live a life, start a business of great generosity. Thank you.